afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Um, we're ready to start the uh, going to the home stretch here and uh, start the second part of the this afternoon, and then conclude. Uh, we may it looks like we may wrap up a little early based on how the morning has gone, um, but we will be soliciting some feedback from the field if you have anything that you want to add to maybe uh, give some examples of experiences you've had. So we'll open up, open up uh, or allow hands to be raised if you want to add uh, some comments. So we'll open that up to the field a little bit and maybe get some more real life examples and liven up the, um, the presentations a little bit. So um, not that they haven't been doing a great job, because they are. It's just uh, it's, it's a hard thing, I'm sure, for you guys to listen to without some uh, other examples. Okay, so Jordan, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, so now we're going to finish up the second avenue for meeting the revitalization exception, and this is the revitalizing <laughs> area portion of it. HUD will consider evidence that the site is located in a revitalizing area, experiencing significant investment, and is demonstrably improving the economic character of the area. And these are not necessarily both required, but HUD should be analyzing all factors and making a determination. The first part is significant private investment. There is high private investment and public investment in retail, commercial, or housing development that has occurred or will imminently occur. Newer improved retail centers, grocery stores, pharmacies, healthcare facilities, community centers, educational and recreational facilities, municipal services, and transportation serving the neighborhood. Private and public investment or housing development that has occurred or will imminently occur. And economic conditions that are impacting the preservation of affordable housing in the neighborhood, including indicators of gentrification, such as housing costs rising more sharply in the neighborhood than in the jurisdiction overall, and accelerated rates of home ownership in the neighborhood and disproportionate depletion of larger dwellings for families with children. And we will also consider on the next slide, demonstrably improving. This means that the neighborhood has demonstrated signs of revitalization through indicators such as lower declining census tract poverty rates, lower declining violent crime rates, evidence of higher increased educational opportunity, higher increasing medium household income, median household income, higher increasing home ownership rates, and higher increasing employment rates. This is a shorter section, but the analysis is very based on statistics instead of, uh, I guess, the more subjective PHA plan. So we'll go open it up to questions now if anyone has any questions on the few slides that we covered. Or you might have some questions on stuff we covered earlier this morning. And that's fine. We'll have time for questions again later if you want to share some observations or comments. And in the meanwhile, we can start going through the checklist for revitalization. So this is picking up where we left off in the checklist. This is the second path to meeting the overriding needs exception. The site is in a neighborhood experiencing significant private investment that is demonstrably improving the economic character of the area. The first question we'll ask is, did the PHA state that this site is in a neighborhood experiencing revitalization? And based on whether you answer this, um, you will either have to perform this analysis or meet the, another exception. So we'll just assume that they are claiming it so we can go through some examples. And just below that, you'll see the overriding housing needs criterion permits approval of sites in a neighborhood experiencing significant private investment that is demonstrably improving the economic character of the area. This is, for shorthand, we just call revitalizing area. I will consider all relevant factors. And these are the same ones we went through on the slide. Signs of revitalization through economic indicators, high public and private investment, and evidence of economic conditions that are impacting the preservation of affordable housing. Now note that this review should take into account the extent to which these factors are present, along with other relevant factors. So these aren't what you're limited to. You can account for more if you have that information available to you. Uh, and it's not sufficient for one of these factors to be present, nor is it required for all of them to be present. 
as the analysis must consider all relevant facts and evaluate the totality of the circumstances. This is a three-part analysis, so all three parts should be considered while making an overall conclusion. So the first one we want to mention specifically are indicators of revitalization. Under the RAD notice, HUD will consider the factors in making the determination as to whether the area is revitalizing. And later on today, we'll have Trisha Ruiz, our geographer and data expert, go over a data table that she made for you. So we can go and scroll down a bit more and we can see table E. This is essentially all of the quantifiable factors in the notice that come from the census data. And what we did is instead of asking reviewers in the field to visit the census website, we had Trisha Ruiz put together a data table that has all this information in one place. And so we can thank her for making our lives that much easier. So I'll just give you one example of one of these. Actually, I'm going to go through it myself. And you can follow along on screen. So we can imagine that if we look up the poverty rates in our data table, let's just use, for example, in 2010 that the poverty rate was at 50%. So the neighborhood is distressed. And then we would also have the information that from 2015, the neighborhood went from 50% poverty rate to 40% poverty rate. We have uh, automation built in to where this will automatically complete for you, and it would come up to be a 10% decrease, which is good. It's a positive trend. The next thing we would want to analyze is the MSA or the county, depending on what area you're in, you use one of those indicators. So let's say that the MSA also started off at a 50% poverty rate in 2015, so it was just as distressed as the census tract. I'm sorry, it started in 2010 at 50%. Then let's say in 2015, the MSA or county went to a 30% poverty rate, and then using the automation, this will automatically populate to come up as 20%. And so we'll have a series of questions after these that will help you make a determination as to how this factor can be interpreted. The difference between the census tract and MSA in 2010. So you look at our 50% for 2010 in the census tract and then our 50% for MSA in 2010 and you, there's a zero difference. So they started off at the same situation. Then what is the difference in 2015 between the census tract and the MSA? So the census tract is at 40 in 2015, and the MSA is at 30 in 2015. So that would be a 20-point difference. And then we analyze this data to make some very basic and useful conclusions. So the census tract data indicates that the census tract improved at a slower rate than the MSA did from 2010 to 2015. So as you see, the census tract went from 50 to 40 percent poverty rate, while the MSA went from 50 to 30. And then the next question we will answer is, based on the data for census tract in columns two through four, this indicator demonstrates, and when I say this indicator, we mean each line item. So in this case, it's poverty. This indicator indicates improvement because the poverty rate went down from the tracks 2010 original 50% poverty rate distressed status. And then the tract is currently still distressed. And so basically, if we were to translate this into a more verbal way of expressing it, we can say that. The census tract showed limited improvement from 2010 to 2015, although it improved at a slower rate than the MSA. And we can conclude based on this that while the trend is positive, the census tract is not keeping up with the surrounding areas. So that's a fact to consider. And then we would also say while there was limited improvement, it's a positive trend going from 50 to 40 percent, the census tract is still distressed because it's at 40 percent poverty rate. And so that's just a way that you can analyze your conclusions for each line item. And as I said later, Trisha Rees will go into a spreadsheet and you can just easily copy and paste all this information into your chart and then you can make these conclusions and that way someone looking at this can get a very effective and quick way to interpret these data. 
We also have here a column, or I'm sorry, a row for other in case there are another factor that is specific to the area that's not necessarily mentioned here, which you can also include. One item might be commute time. Uh, in a recent RAD review, you, in a recent RAD review that I was doing, you might want to look at um, commute time relative to that of the MSA or county. Because if the commute time is longer or the same, while income is lower or the same, then you might want to then you might draw the conclusion that people in that census tract or neighborhood have to travel farther to earn the same or less money compared to their peers in the wider area. And then we have a few questions that the notice wants us to consider but aren't necessarily included in the table because the census doesn't show us that data. One of those factors is the level of educational opportunity and Later on, Trisha Ruiz is going to show you in the AFFHT one of the tables that you can pull up to analyze educational opportunity, or at least a proxy for that indicator. And we have that available in the AFFH tool. So she'll show you how to analyze that. Another indicator the notice encourages us to analyze is the level of violent crime in the area. We don't have any neighborhood level data for the census tract. The FBI website has it for the MSA, but then again, that's not necessarily reflective of the neighborhood in particular when you just consider the MSA overall. So if crime happens to be a particular problem in the neighborhood that the PHA selected, you might want to look either on the local municipality's website or other independent websites you might be familiar with to find information about local crime. And then you might give you a better picture of the area. And then we have space for you to determine whether or not the census tract is healthy or distressed in its current state, and that's question C. And then you can explain your analysis here. So you could, for example, say while there was limited improve improvement, the, the poverty rate is still very high and the median income is still very low, so the neighborhood is still distressed. So that, this would be the place to explain your analysis here. And we also would like you to know whether the PHA's claims of revitalization are accurate. And you can go in and verify those claims. Because, for example, the PHA may not have access or may not include the data information that we have. So if they say that it is revitalizing when the economic indicators show a different story, this would be your place to explain that. And letter E is asking you to compare the trend the trend change from 2010 to 2015 within the census tract. And that is basically, you can see here, if we go back up to the table, the difference between 2010 and 2015 in the census tract. And this is just giving you some space under E to write any additional information that you want another reviewer to look at. And then again, we provide you space to give you your interpretation and explain maybe how this either confirms or contrasts with what the PHA was claiming in their submission. Then nearly in the last spot um, we have a place for you to also explain the difference between the MSA over time. So then you can also explain well the census tracts improved but not as quickly as the MSA improved and you can maybe explain why the MSA was doing better as we spoke about earlier but could be like citywide improvement where the particular neighborhood lags behind in some places. And again, we have space for you to determine or to express what your conclusions were and also compare them to the assertions that the PHA made. And then we have in question I, sort of the ultimate question, whether on the whole the indicators above suggest that the census tract is improving compared to the MSA or county. In other words, did the census tract trend in one direction while the MSA trended in another? And that would be pretty clear cut. For example, if the census tract declines, if median income goes down and the MSA goes up, we can assume that the census tract is not doing well. We would, we would deduce from that that it's also not revitalizing, especially when the, of the surrounding area is. There wouldn't necessarily be a good reason to build more housing there. And then again, we have the place to 
contrast your conclusion with that of the PHA? And then we ask the question about the trend itself. Does the trend support the conclusion that the census tract is revitalizing relative to the MSA? And then we have the final question. Based on all of this analysis above for part one, do the data indicate that the site is located in a revitalizing area? And you can summarize your conclusion. And this would be some place for you to add any extras that weren't captured above, like maybe that crime is actually improving. But what it doesn't show is that more police departments were added, and that's why crime was uh, going down. So you can add even more explanations as to why you might improve or disapprove this, this exception. The second consideration for revitalizing area is public and private investment in the neighborhood. And these investments claimed by the PHA should be verified through supporting documentation, either submitted by the PHA or independently gathered by the reviewer. This can involve conducting internet research regarding the investment, such as checking the website of the entity making the investment, or through articles by local reporters or bloggers. You could even call around to housing developments and see what the price of the houses are going for that are being sold in the area, whether or not they're sold out, and maybe any other plans to do renovations. And then you can learn some pretty interesting things from the people running those uh, housing, housing projects. And here are the different examples of types of investments that you could have in the community that would be signs of revitalization. I'll give you one quick example that we built into the checklist here is that's grocery stores. In some instances, these projects will be located in food deserts or will be surrounded by food deserts. And so the residents won't actually have uh, reasonable opportunities to buy food. And that's definitely not something we want to put people in the situation for. So if a current plan for a new grocery store is coming into the area, that's really good. And you can map the distance between the project and the site for the new grocery store. So then that way you can determine whether or not it's close enough to actually benefit the residents. Some other useful information other than the distance would be the investment amounts. Would it be a new construction? Are they just renovating the facade? Are they expanding? This might be also another way to kind of gauge whether the neighborhood is coming back, whether it's declining, is how much money they're investing into their grocery stores or other, other items on this list. We also want the status of it, because as we mentioned when we were checking the revitalizing plan, when looking into the status of a building project, if it's not started, if it's only in the planning phase, that's not really good enough to get it to where we need to be. If certain funds have been committed, that's a, that's a positive step. And I think the ultimate one is to have ground broken on a new project. And that will show that it's actually going to happen. Then we have just a little bit of room for you to explain anything, like if funds have been committed or if the site has been identified, but no financial incentives have been given for the store to actually open up there. And then we have your conclusion, just a quick checklist at the end of each item. Does this investment apply? Can they count it towards their revitalizing area exception? So we can just go through a few others. Retail centers, that's uh, important to have local businesses that support the housing. Grocery stores we just talked about. Pharmacies, if it gets into maybe specifics, especially of the age of the population that they're serving, they might include that information in the PHA submission. Healthcare facilities community centers, educational facilities, recreational facilities, municipal services, that's also a very important one. Um, if the area is located in a place that might not necessarily be easy for residents to get to jobs, you would want them to have municipal services. If it's a highly residential zone, but they have to travel far to get into the city or wherever the local anchor employment institution is, you want to look at transportation and also are these places close to police departments? Are they close to other things that the residents would need? And then also housing development. That's a big one, too. If you have private investment going into an area, you can, you can uh, make a conclusion that, that that in and of itself would bring in higher income residents. And also, those residents would then get more services and all the things above going to the area. So if there's lots of market rate housing going into an area, that's a very strong indicator. That's definitely something to be on the lookout for. And the opposite is also true. If most of the area is vacant housing or vacant lots, 
and housing prices are going down, then we have to consider that a negative factor. We also have other in case there are some other factors you want to consider or that the PHA points out that you feel is relevant. Then we have space for a narrative based on these factors above. Do you think that the site is located in an area that is receiving significant public and private investment? And then you can sort of explain and summarize your conclusion right below it. I'm going to pause for questions here because that was a lot of material to go through. And we can pick up with gentrification, the last part, right when we get back. I'm not seeing any questions for right now. Any last chance? All right. I know everyone's so excited they want to hear the rest of it for number three, so we'll get we'll get back to it. And so this last this last criteria doesn't come up very often, but we'll just go through it here and see if anyone has questions for it. This is um, if there's a risk of losing affordable housing because there's so much gentrification in the area, which, as I said, doesn't come up often, but we'll go through it. So please complete the following section with data provided by the PHA that demonstrates that the neighborhood is losing affordable housing or at risk of losing affordable housing due to gentrification. This may include evidence that housing costs are rising more sharply in the neighborhood than in the jurisdiction overall, that there are accelerated rates of home ownership in the neighborhood, and that the neighborhood has experienced a disproportionate depletion of larger dwellings for families with children. So basically, it's, um, it's trying to say that the neighborhood is trending upwards, that it's gentrifying, it's so good that there's not any, uh, that they're at risk of losing enough affordable housing opportunities for the residents. Um, and these are some of the questions that you should ask yourself if this happens, or if this is what the PHA claims. Uh, based on the data in the revitalization area Excel spreadsheet, which Trisha will be showing you, and additional information available to the department, are housing costs rising more sharply in the area than in the jurisdiction overall? And we have some of that information in our data table that we can show you. And that's, that's a pretty clear-cut one. If the housing prices are going higher, you can assume that there's some gentrification going on, but there are other factors to consider also. And then based on your analysis, are claims made by the PHA regarding housing costs in the census tract accurate? This is, again, just another area for you to sort of confirm what they say or maybe contrast it if your conclusions are different based on the data. And then, based on, and then number C, uh, letter C, based on the revitalization area Excel spreadsheet, and additional information, are accelerated rates of home ownership in the neighborhood. So are there more people buying homes in the area than are renting them? Or is that rate of people that are doing that increasing? That's also a good sign that the area is gentrifying. And then based on your analysis, are claims made by the PHA regarding home ownership rate in the census tract accurate? Now, they may not make any claims at all regarding this factor, especially if they don't claim it. So you might not have, you might just have non-applicable there. And then sort of the ultimate question, based on the data above and additional information available to the department, does the area show signs of gentrification through housing costs rising more sharply in the jurisdiction and also rates of home ownership? And I think this would be a pretty, um, this would be a pretty strong factor that is being demonstrated. And I think you would have very strong indicators if you, you were to see this, because usually for these projects, we don't have the risk of losing too many affordable housing unless they're explicitly demolishing them. That, that's kind of a different issue. Um, we can scroll down, I think. Yeah, then there's one more. This is if the PHA provides it for letter F. Based on the information provided by the PHA, list the family properties in the neighborhood, particularly those with larger dwellings for families of children that have been lost or are at risk of being lost due to gentrification. So basically, if again, 
for some reason they're losing affordable housing and the area is revitalized and we don't want the residents to miss out on this revitalization just because you know affordable housing is being priced out or demolished so that's just something we want to consider and it says you can uh, take the appropriate steps to verify this information to see if uh, these houses are being demolished or if the PHA didn't claim this exception then you could just skip it so I think that's that's not too common but we do want to go through it there because it is in the notice we have a table that you can actually enter this information for if they do provide it to you and if they do claim that exception. And this is just very basic, the name of the property, the address, the bedroom distribution, the date the units were lost if they were, and the types of subsidies or affordable programs that they participate in. And then you also want to know what the distance is from the site that is being uh, reviewed today or reviewed in this checklist. So we have, a, we have a list for three properties there. You can expand that list if you need to. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact your desk officer for a follow-up if, if this issue does come up. And then we just have G, based on this information, is the site located in the area experiencing loss of affordable housing? And this would probably require a little bit more explanation on your part, depending on what the PHA is able to provide and what they assert. So you can also relay that here. And then the last question for this section, based on the information provided by the PHA and available to the department, is there sufficient evidence that is located in an area where economic conditions are impacting the preservation of affordable housing? And you can just sum it up and give us your conclusion in H. And so then based on those three parts, the um, economic indicators, the revitalizing area investments like gross groceries, housing, et cetera, and then the preservation of affordable housing, you can answer the question to Part C, which is a summary of your conclusion based on your three-part analysis. Did the PHA provide sufficient evidence that the site is in a neighborhood that is experiencing significant private investment and is demonstrably improving the economic character of the area? And just like we said before, all of these factors are not required, but you should consider all of them in making your conclusion. We'll pause here if we can ask some questions, maybe based on this section for revitalizing area. All right, looks like we don't have any questions at the moment. So if we think of any, we can always come back to this later. But I think the next section we have here, later on, in the, later on in the checklist, we can show you how to go through our data tables. And these will show you how to answer more sufficiently the economic indicators. Normally, we can show you how to do this manually, I can show you how to go through the census very briefly just to show you what that looks like in case for some reason the data table is not available to you. I can, I can go and show you that. So you'd like to go to the American Fact Finder website. And I click, I just did a quick Google search American Fact Finder website and then you click on the Get Data tab as I showed. And then you will type in the address that you're looking for. So I'll just, we'll just use the same example that we looked at yesterday.
then we can see here we've got the information that we need to look up in our data table, the census tract. So for example, 1400 East Monument Street in Baltimore, Maryland is located in census tract 1002. I think as Rob Runner mentioned yesterday, these census tracts sometimes have different numbers. So it could be 1,000, not for this one, but each one has a different number. So they could be longer, they could be shorter, they could be decimal. So don't let that, don't let that throw you off. Um, in this particular case, it's 1,002. So that's one important piece of information that we want to have is the census tract. And then the second part we want to look for is the metropolitan statistical area, or as we like to say for short, the MSA. And this is in the Baltimore, Columbia, Towson metropolitan statistical area. Just to give you a real quick view of what it looks like when you click on it. Go to topics at the top after you click on the Baltimore tract. And then you could ask for something like, the decennial census. So here we have poverty. I'm going to get rid of the decennial census um, filter so this not coming up. So here's one we can look at poverty in the past 12 months. This will basically give you some information for 2017. This is the one indicator we were looking at earlier in our table, unemployment. We can measure it here. So we can see that in Census Track 1002, which is where our hypothetical project is located, we have 144 persons unemployed. There's a high margin of error on this one because it's only from one year. So take that with a grain of salt. And then it gives us a estimate of how many of those people are below the poverty level. So I think that's a very useful indicator. If the next step would be to then compare this to the earlier year, or the earliest year that we have. And so you can see it actually went down. So it went from 263 to I think it was 126 between those two different years from 2012 to 2015. And so you could you could you could see that there is a positive trend on this indicator. And then for our data tables, we actually provide this information in a much easier way to get to it. You don't really have to look it up in all these different years. It's in one very easy to use, color-coded, laid out way. So we can show you that in a little bit. Um, we'll pause for just a second here. Do we have any questions regarding the census data? Because this could be kind of new and tricky for people that aren't familiar with it. So we'll just give people a second. All right, so we'll take a moment here to open it up to the field because I know you guys have different experiences based on your geographies and maybe you might want to share with us a little bit of your unique challenges and your site neighborhood reviews. So, you know, we can ask maybe like Puerto Rico has some interesting ones, I would think, or maybe in California. You have different concerns than we might have here on the East Coast. So if anyone from the field has a question or a comment, we'd love to hear your experiences too. For anyone who might not have been with us before, you can uh, raise your hand using the feature in the webinar, and we'll call on you and unmute your line.
in in the meantime, we can maybe we can think of some ideas just to give folks on the line a chance to think of some of their own experiences. I can share some some that might prompt some ideas based on your own site and neighborhood reviews. Um, and I also would clarify the checklist. So, for example, in the checklist, let me bring it up here. So, in the checklist, we have I know because this question will come up sooner or later, so we can answer it here. In the checklist, we have these questions in the chart that say improve, decline, little change, improvement, decline, little change. And so there is no actual absolute value for what little change means. There's no hard and fast rule. If you have a small improvement, say from, say you start with, start out with a really low median income, like $9,000, and you shoot it up to $11,000, technically that's an improvement. And if you look at the percentage-wise um, representation of that, it would be a, a, a decent-looking percentage. But you would have to look at the actual value behind the percentage, say from nine to eleven thousand dollars, is uh, actually still a very low, intrinsically low number. And so we would so we would say that there's actually little change and that the area would still remain stressed even though there was a positive trend. And so uh, those numbers would remain relative to each individual area and you have some discretion there in determining what would be appropriate in terms of considering it an improvement or no change. And just to point out, we have some of these here are a little bit tricky. Our automation table takes care of this for you, but just to be aware, if you look it up manually, lower decreasing poverty rates, when these numbers go down, that's a good thing, of course. Same with unemployment rate. When the unemployment rate goes down, that's good. But when we have median income or increasing home ownership rates, when those goes up, that's a good thing. Just something to keep in mind when you're looking at this data. If you don't have uh, the tool in front of you, you can just look at the numbers and get a good sense of how the track has been progressing over time. And that would be the same thing with these types of investments for community improvements. If you have a very large, uh, say, shopping complex or a grocery store that's maybe $5, 10 $15 million investment, but it's located 10 or 12 miles away, you have to maybe discount that a little bit. Even though it's a great development, it's not necessarily close enough for the residents to get a direct benefit from. Um, and, in, and the inverse is also true. If it's very close, it maybe doesn't need to be as big of an investment to have a positive impact, something that's more tangible. And those are just covering some of the bases for um, a more subjective review. This is also just a reminder here, the overriding housing needs recommendation. This is a three-part analysis, so that is the revitalization of the area, the integral plan, and the gentrification. We don't need all of those, but any one of those in combination with the other should be considered to make a recommendation. We will go ahead, just one, one last time we'll look at questions and see if there's anybody in the field that has any questions or maybe any examples they want to share from site neighborhood reviews they're doing and that might be coming up in the region. It also doesn't hurt to have a site visit, too. If you're close to the area, you can definitely see if it's possible to go out there and get a first-hand view of some of these different investments that are being asserted. While we're waiting on questions, I think I just want to go over, you know, um, 
some ways to think about this analysis. Um, in thinking of our experience with doing these reviews, we have had instances where the PHA has been able to successfully claim this, this exception, even if the data, they hadn't really shown, the sense the, any improvements in the neighborhood hadn't really shown up in census data yet. Um, an example I'm thinking of is when we've had um, PHAs that have had choice, imp choice neighborhoods implementation grants. So when they've actually not just received a planning grant, but have received a $30 million implementation grant, um, a lot of times they'll have just started doing the investments, but because they have a comprehensive plan and because they have the $30 million backing from the department, we've been able to say, well, this neighborhood is experiencing significant investment, even though, you know, the investment might be so new that it might not yet show up in the in the data tables that, that Jordan showed you. So I think that's one thing to, to keep in mind is as you look at this. And I mean, and another thing is sometimes the the change might be so recent, it might not be in the census data, but the PHA can show you other sorts of data or evidence um, of improving economic characteristics. Like they might be able to show some recent home sales data in the neighborhood that shows uh, like a, a price increase that's very recent that again might not show up in the data um, pulled from the census. We do have a question from Andrew. When will the checklist be finalized? Yeah, I think. Andrew, yeah, go on. So, yeah. Um, so Andrew, the um, checklist is finalized as, as of now. You'll see it's version 1.2. That means we've uh, made some revisions here in headquarters just as we've tested it out. But um, it could be revised based on testing it out in the field and how that works for you. So um, we may do a little bit of that, or if there's additional information we've learned as we're uh, implementing, it may change as well. But right now, that is the final checklist. Good question. So Gloria, do you want to? <coughs> So Gloria's going to talk about, um, uh, anonymously talk about one of her experiences in evaluating a site neighborhood standard from the oh. lab. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, just a couple of things about one of the site and neighborhood standards review that I um, came across and some of the interesting um, things. Um, the actual project site was actually located on the edge of where the plan revitalization or gentrification that was going to take um, occur for the entire um, neighborhood. Um, so it kind of how we had to figure out how was that project site or the neighborhood going to benefit from um, the revitalization that was going to happen or take place adjacent to it. Um, another interesting thing, the PHA also submitted um, two plans. Um, and one of the plans was actually a, a project or a um, part, of, part of a graduate program. So I had to go dig deep and further and review the plan and see that it actually was never adopted or, or even, you know, put, in, put into um, practice or operational. Um, but I did find that the, um, the area that um, we were looking in, while it wasn't um, the best area, they did have plans to, like, you know, as Jordan mentioned, you know, update the sidewalks and traffic lights and make the, the, um, the neighborhood actually like a main corridor for um, the city. So they were just interesting. I feel like I had to do a lot of digging into um, to, to kind of confirm the, what the PHA was submitted. Um, let's check with the field again, see if there are questions, or we may be able to pivot to our next presenter, Tricia.
Yeah, and so now we have on the line here coming up is Trisha Ruiz. She's our geographer, and she put together this wonderful data table that you'll be able to use so you don't have to go into the census and look up this uh, information manually for our economic indicators. Okay, Trisha, I'm going to uh, make you the presenter so your screen will be visible to everybody in the group here. Great. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey, Trisha. Hi, Trisha. Hi. Uh, for those of you who, um, who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Trisha Ruiz. I'm here in FHEO here in Seattle, and um, I am outstationed and currently detailed to the um, Oakleo house um, in FHEO. So I am um, happy to present here some data that uh, Celia and Jordan and the team asked me to provide uh, to help in, this, um, in your standard review efforts. Let me see here. I think I have an option here. Hopefully you can see. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, it looks like we can see you. Great. All right. Um, so when, I, when Celia and Jordan um, asked me about this section of the standards review, we ended up putting together these tables because these there's five, six indicators, but there's five we'll talk about right now and six I'll talk about towards the end. But there's five indicators to, to diagnose whether a neighborhood, how, how it's done over time and how it does compared to the larger area it's in. So it's two general ways to see, sort of check the health of how um, all, all of these different measures. And so uh, we have poverty median household income, home ownership rates, unemployment rates, and housing costs. And um, just to give you some context, I'm on page seven, 17 here of the document I think that we've all been looking through the last few days. And normally for all of these data, these data points, users would have to go to the American Fact Finder, and they'd have to go through all these different steps. I'm sure all of us have done it once or twice trying to get all these different data sets. Um, I have some screenshots here of the documents that I, or the ta different tables that I've gone through. Um, to get poverty, for example, we got table B17001, which is poverty status in the past 12 months. So it takes the population, and let me see if I can zoom in here a bit. I know it's a little hard. So we take the population and the number of people whose income in the past 12 months are below poverty level, we take that, so we take 1,071 and divide that by the total population, and we get a rate of 26.2. So this is telling me, and let me back up here, I picked a census tract here where our office in Seattle is located. So I put in an address in the American Fact Finder and got a census tract, and I always have to know um, just going forward, you'll always have to know the state, the county, and the census tract number. And we're always going to continually search through all these data using those, those three key facts. And from what I understand, um, from the beginning of the, the review, the tract number is given. But if we want, if you have questions about not being able to find that, we can return to that at the end. And um, comparing this neighborhood here, census tract 81, I wanted to compare it to the larger metro area just to see how it how it you know how I compare it to the larger area, and this is current or the most current is 2015, and their their percentage rate um, their percentage of the population who are in poverty is 11.3. So this is a big difference. There's more than double the amount of people in poverty in this neighborhood where our office is located compared to the larger region. So um, we also repeat this exercise for older data, so for 2010, because we wanted to see how does that look over time. And um, we get here ten, uh, five years ago, well, seven years ago, but in the difference, the two data sets we're looking at are 2010 and 2015. Uh, we take the same numbers and we get a rate of 39% in poverty compared to the larger area of 10%. So in 2010, we were three times as high. So just toggling back and forth between these two, we went from 39 to 26. So it actually went down. So that is a positive trend from 2010 to 2015. And the metro area, 
they stayed at 10 percent to 11 percent they didn't change too much but we we in this neighborhood did a drastic um, reduction from 39 percent to 26 percent so compared to the larger area we're, we still have a relatively high poverty rate but um, over time we've reduced it so these kind of things are the questions you're going to be asking um, when we fill in the data here Well, let me go ahead and go to the next example here. That was poverty. One of the other data sets we're going to look at are housing costs, higher increasing housing costs. So um, what we, the table that we used for that is table S2503, it's financial characteristics. And it allowed us to get data for 2010 and 2015. And at the bottom of this table, again, I searched, at the time I searched through Census Track 81 in King County, Washington, and I also looked at the metro. So the monthly housing cost for homeowners, so there's a couple of columns here. This is all units, this is owner-occupied, this is renter. Um, for all owner-occupied uh, residents here in this tract, their, uh, the, their median house, uh, sorry, owner-occupied housing unit costs monthly are 2500, roughly 2500 In the metro area, the median cost is about 1700 $1,800. And we're also able to pull that up for time, so that's the most current. Prior to that, it was around 2400 and about 1700 So neither really changed. Uh, this tract is relatively higher compared to the metro area, but over time, neither the tract or the metro really changed. Um, and one thing I'm just going to kind of hint to you on these red circles, this is all going to be in one table at the end that we've all put together for you so you can um, reduce the time of clicking around and, and uh, trying to find these different data sets. But it's also a good um, practice for you to know that this is where it comes from. And if you ever want to ask more questions, you'll say, oh, wait a minute, Trisha pulled it from S2503. Let me go see what that table is about. And you can go and look at it yourself right from the source. But we've put together a table where you won't have to go through these steps. But I think it's important for us to walk through where we got it from and what these data are actually telling us. The next data point we are going to look at is home ownership rates. So what percentage of residents are homeowners compared to renters? And that's in what we call a tenure data set. Table B25003 uh, in the American Census, uh, sorry, American Community Survey. <clears throat> and again, here you have to do some back of the envelope calculations that I put here in these yellow tabs. But we have the num the total number of residents in this tract is 2,400, about 2,478, and the number who own their own home is uh, f about 500. So that's about 20% when you calculate that. In the greater metro area, it's close to 60%. So it's three times the rate that we have. Uh, there's three times more people owning a house across the metro area compared to this particular tract that our office is in. If you look at it five years ago or five years prior to that, that data collection point, it was not too different. It was 23% and 62% 62 um, comparing the two. So again, not too much difference over time nor was there difference, um, you know, the track wasn't out, the neighborhood wasn't outpacing the metro area. They pretty much stayed the same as well within a couple of percentage points. The next data point we are looking at is unemployment rate. And that's pretty straightforward. On this table, what was nice is this, this was already calculated for us. Sorry, allow me to scroll through here. All right, so, in the ACS, the table number is S2301, employment status. And it's already calculated for you, so there is no back of the hand calculations necessary. At the track, at this time, in 2015, it was just under 9% in this particular neighborhood. Across the region, it was about 7%, so slightly higher. Five years ago, it was 12% 12, 
and this was about 7%. So let me toggle back up here. 7% did not drastically change for the metro area. So the overall, it stayed pretty steady from 2010 to 2015. However, in 2010, this, this neighborhood had 12% unemployment rate, and it went down to, eight, to, to just under 9%. So it is in a positive trend in that direction. And compared to the metro, there wasn't anything striking. We do um, have slightly, in 2010, there was a, a relatively high, higher employment rate here in the neighborhood compared to the area, to the larger area. But it's gotten better compared to the larger area over time. And the other data point we're going to look at is median household income. So um, this is table B19013. And when I look up the track in the, in the metro area, I find that the median household income in 2015 was about 75,000. And um, in this neighborhood, at the metro area, it was about 70,000. So within 5,000 um, of, annual, uh, of annual income a year um, is the difference between the median um, uh, income in the track versus the median income across the, the larger region. Five years ago, look how low it was. It was 33,000. So it more than doubled in this, in this particular neighborhood. In the metro area, it, it increased slightly right, from 65,000 to 70,000, but um, far, far less than the difference here in 2010 for this neighborhood that was just around 34,000 and is now um, 75,000, so it's doubled since then. And I, um, and these are the kind of things that you are going to know. You know, median household income has increased, so maybe there's an influx of, of, um, of a population that has larger wages, and maybe there's new construction where they're able to move in. So these kind of indicators may be leaning, open up questions you may want to ask about why there's such a difference over time and also how that differs, that neighborhood differs compared to the larger area. So to get all of these different things, it probably took me, oh, about an hour to go through American Fact Finder and enter in the geography and enter in the table numbers. And these tables, um, these are the condensed uh, tables. They're much larger. And so I've just taken screenshots of what's most relevant to us. And then some of these, as you saw, required some back of the envelope calculation. What we have put together here is this, it's a, it's a large Excel file, and it looks pretty daunting here. But it is meant to make things easier for you. So um, I'm going to step back here and just point out that in the, in the RAD review, we're asked to fill out table E on page 16 for these, all these indicators. And then once you um, obtain all those numbers that I had in those red circles and the screenshots I had, you would put them in here and you would make an analysis. You would say, what's the difference between um, over time at the track? So in the neighborhood, did it go up or did it go down? Did poverty rates increase or decrease? And you would have a value here. You would subtract one from the other. And um, you would do the same with at the metro level. And you'd also compare how the in 2010, at the starting point, how did the track compare to the metro area? And also, how did uh, five years later, how did the track compare to the metro area? Um, and based on all of these indicators, you would answer these last three um, these last two columns on whether the census track seems to improve or decline, um, and did it decline relatively uh, faster than the metro area, or you know, was there a little change? And the, the same similar question here. Does it look like the, the neighborhood is distressed or not distressed based on these indicators? And this same table, I this same table in the Word document, we have as an Excel file. I, it's titled exactly the same, Table E, Indicators of Revitalization. And these are color coded. So the only thing different from this screen that you see here, I'm just zooming in and out so you can see what that looks like, um, is that we have it color-coded uh, to match this. And the reason we've done that is because in this large source file, 
we, we can take these numbers here, and they would be the same numbers that go in here. But before we do that, let's go ahead and do a search, a real life search for, let's look at the track that I was looking at this whole time. So in order to get this data table here, has 75, about 74,000 rows representing each track across the country and Puerto Rico. So all 50 states plus Puerto Rico. Um, to scroll down these would take forever. So what we do, what we have here is it's in filter, and we've locked this date, this table, so you can't really mess it up. You can filter through it, but there's nothing that you can really do to um, change the numbers or anything. We'll, we'll have a, uh, we've protected the worksheet that way. So I'm going to start off, when you go to this data set, the first thing you want to do is filter from left to right in these white, uh, white columns. So I would first go to um, click on this little arrow here, and you'll see that all of right now these check boxes indicate all of them are displayed. I can either click this first one to deselect all the states, then scroll down to Washington, and I would click that and click OK. And you'll see here that all of the rows were hidden now except for Washington. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the same here on the next column. I'll deselect all and scroll down to King County where we're located. Or another thing we can do is when you first open up this box, instead of unclicking and clicking these check boxes, you can type in the name King. It down, narrows down this list. So I keep the check box under King and deselect all. Oh, it had me undeselect King. So just make sure that only King is selected and go ahead and click OK. And you'll see now that the list has even whittled down even further to just tracks in King County. Now, the track that I was looking at here is Census Track 81, King County, Washington. I've narrowed down, I've gotten to the list uh, for just King County and Washington. So I go back to the source data and I look for 81. So the one thing that's odd about this is that these are the Excel reads these as text files, not as numbers. So you will see this odd way of numbering them. So, uh, number two comes before 20, but number two comes after Census Tract 19. It's it's not intuitive at first, but you'll just see here you can scroll through it. And again, what I can do to narrow down the list is I can hit in 81. And it has, gives me a couple of choices. I deselect them all, and I click just on the one I'm interested in. Now this looks, this looks like a much more manageable table. And what I do is then take these yellow numbers, and you'll see here these columns correspond to what we see on the table that uh, is in the review that we have copied into an Excel file. So we take this, I've highlighted this data here, all the yellow rows, I right click on it, go ahead and click copy, then you pop over to um, what you want to do is make sure that all these files are open so you can quickly maneuver to them here on the bottom of your screen, and then I highlight those same cells here, or you could simply click on this, and you can right click and hit paste, and you'll see those same numbers are there. Um, we can zoom in a little bit after we've done all the pasting. And we'll do the same, we'll go through the exercise here. So the next set of indicators we want to look at is median household income for the tract and for the metro area. And um, one thing I wanted to point out here, when I say metro area, it's housing market area. Um, and the difference really is that if a tract is located or a county is located outside a metro area, it uses the, the housing market area is actually using county data instead of metro data when they're the more rural areas that are not in metro areas. So the catch-all sort of umbrella term we use is housing market area and just depending on whether it's um, in a metro area or not, it could be county or it could be metro area. We've kept it simple to just say housing market area. <clears throat> So the next set, I'll highlight all across this peach, um, this peach-like color, and I'll right-click on it. Again, click Copy. 
go over to here. Um, I'll click on the first the set of cells here, or I can just click on the first one. Right click, and right here under paste, you see how there's several different icons here? Pick the first one. And then we're going to continue going on here um, to do the rest. So it's a bit mechanical in the beginning. Um, actually, I think I pasted some uh, colors that I shouldn't have here, but let me go ahead and take care of this here. Um, I actually may be pasting the wrong color. Let's see here. There's a little bit of a bug where the color changes, but it is the right one. I'll go ahead and look into that, why that's doing that. It should stay this same color here. But at this point, after you've copied them all, it's really just the, the color coding was just to help guide you to pull the right numbers over. Um, and green is sort of common sense. If you see numbers here, you know you've pulled either income for households or housing costs. Um, but you haven't pulled home ownership rates. So um, I'll take a look at that bug. I didn't see that that, was, that wasn't happening when we were testing it out, but I'll take a look at it. For some reason, it's carrying over the wrong color, and I don't mean to confuse you. And I'll do one more here before we start to take a look at this. You won't have to do this green color changing. I'm just doing this for for our purposes here. So um, let's see if we can make these numbers a little bigger. All right, so we have color coded. Uh, the team asked me to color code what the difference is when we're comparing what we're being asked to compare is, was the change between in the neighborhood, um, was it positive or, or negative change? And between the metro area, was it also in the larger area, was it a um, an increase or decrease in whatever measure we're looking at. And then how did the track compare overall to the metro area? So just looking at the track here, this is the number we showed before. Almost four out of 10 people in this neighborhood were in poverty in 2010. In 2015, that was just over two, two out of 10. So it reduced by half, almost half, and so what is that percentage change? If I take the first number, 39, about 39 um, on the, of, for rate of um, poverty. Sorry, it wasn't unemployment. I'm talking poverty here. Apologize. So four out of 10 uh, residents in the census tract in 2010 lived in poverty. They had income levels that qualified them for living in poverty. And um, in 2015, that reduced to 26%. So the difference is 13. And the reason this is blue is because it was a positive change. We want to take a look at this. Poverty rate's going down. That's a good thing. So these numbers that are in blue in indicate positive change. Let's take a look at the metro area. The metro area slightly increased, but not by much, about 1% um, higher in poverty across the metro area. And the bigger picture, what we want to look at here, is how did we do better? How did the track do better than the um, metropolitan area? Um, and we decreased by 13%, which is much better than the overall metro area. So this shows positive change for neighborhood poverty rate. And this is just the difference between the census tract and the metro area. So not looking at change over time, but really, let's just look at 2010. So, so about seven years ago, when this data was collected, the poverty rate here in the census tract was 39%. In the metro area, it was only 10%. So it's four times more. So when you take the, the numerical difference between the two, you get a, a number of 29. But because that it's in red, because that's actually um, something to flag. It's something to flag that the track was much higher than the metro area in 2010. This column to the right here 
is also in red because in 2015, although the rate had gone down to 20, from 39 to 26% in the neighborhood, when you compare it to at the same time period in the metro area, it was still more than double. So the numerical difference here is 14.9. I wouldn't get lost in the, you know, the decimal points, but this worksheet, this tool is meant to point out there was, there was a positive trend over time, but comparing itself to the metro, it wasn't, it was, the neighborhood was not doing very well compared to the overall um, area. And for each of these, it's the same thing. And you're going to have to think things through. Um, this is why I thought it was important um, to walk through this because you're, when, you, know, you get so many numbers and you get lost in them and you're saying, what am I really looking at? Well, poverty status, when I was looking at that row and trying to sink that in here, I just have to pay attention to the blue versus the red. Um, for household income here, um, this actually should be blue. Sorry, the, the, this, some of this coding may be. Um, but blue should indicate, um, we pay, we'll, we'll fix this bug when we're there, but um, should indicate an increase in income, which we did see in the beginning. Um, it more than doubled to 75000 So this number um, should actually be blue because it does show the difference. So I'm sorry that that's a little confusing. This first row, this first row here is actually um, how you should be interpreting all of these. And uh, just to point out here that unemployment rates and poverty rates, those are things that are good when they're lower, of course. Home ownership rates and, um, and median household income are better when they're higher, and that's just a little um, intuitive here. So just looking up at home ownership rates is a good example. In 2010, uh, it was at 22%. It, it went down slightly, so there were fewer homeowners in 2015 compared to the period five years prior. So it went down by about 3%. In the overall metro area, it also went down about 3%. So it stayed at the same pace in general as the metro area. But if you want to compare the tract to the metro area, how it's doing, in both 2010 and 15, it was a much lower rate of home ownership. So there are many, um, uh, fewer homeowners in this neighborhood compared to the larger metro area. So going through this exercise, you would copy and paste all of this in here um, and have the, the blue numbers indicate positive change and uh, ne uh, red numbers indicate negative change. And you would take this section here and um, let me zoom in here. For each of those indicators, the review, the the reviewer um, just needs to decide: did it did it improve or did it decline? Is there more red than blue, or more blue than red? And sort of think about that from from these perspectives: did the census tract do better over time, and then did the census tract do better compared to the larger area? So these are the um, these are sort of a cheat sheet. You can circle or underline which ones apply to uh, to that particular measure based on what you, the numbers that you pasted over. Um, so before I go into the next measure, do we have any questions on this so far? All right, um, the next measure I wanted to take a look at is the um, section here just below the table on pages 16 and 17. And that's uh, question A at the top of page 18. And it's asking the uh, reviewer to take a look at the census tract and educational opportunities, so school quality. Um, in the AFFHT, we don't have data like the census that compares change over time, at least not yet. We just have one point in time data. But what you can do with the data in AFFHT is you can take a particular neighborhood and compare it to the larger region, which is what we did in the other table. And um, let me show you, before we go into the actual numbers and how you would explain this, let's go ahead and go into the tool here. I'm sure many of you have seen this already. 
So we'll start from the beginning. What we're looking for in particular here is MAP 8, or MAP 7, I'm sorry. So we'll go ahead and pick DC, for example. Um, in DC, there are two types of um, funding streams here. One is for home, and one is for CDBG and ESG. That just represents the boundaries um, for which they are receiving funds. And then we'll go ahead and click Select a Map. We leave this as jurisdiction as default. Many of you are aware there are several maps. There's about 17 choices for maps here. What we're particularly looking for to answer that question in the RAD review is Map 7. And you'll see here you can layer on race, ethnicity, national origin, family status. You can just stick with one because for this particular question, we're not even more, we're not going to focus on that too much. We're going to look at really that school proficiency index. All right, so there's a lot going on here. What I would suggest you do immediately is you click on this I button on the right, and TOC stands for Table of Contents. Those of you that used this map before, you're familiar with this. I would go ahead and turn off the demographics layer because what you're particularly interested in is the school proficiency index. So after I turn that off, I'm going to click on the legend, and um, these are uh, the, the purple magenta areas are tracks that are racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty. Um, this boundary here is DC, uh, CDBG, and ESG uh, boundaries. And this larger, darker um, boundary is the region. So if you were to zoom out just a bit, you'll see the boundaries of the overall DC region. And if you just wanted to see which region you are in, you can click on Map Info, and it'll tell you which map you're on which jurisdiction you chose, and also the region within which that region is, the jurisdiction is located. So the meat of this map is really in the school proficiency index. And th this is how, how you interpret this is a neighborhood ranking. So this takes all the neighborhoods in the state of, uh, well, in this case it's in DC, all the neighborhoods across uh, DC, and it ranks them based on their school quality. The raw data is based on fourth grade scores, and um, it also includes things like uh, free and reduced lunch. There's a complex formula behind it, but what we've done in the AFFHT is really to simplify it and compare them across. So in the school proficiency index, higher means more opportunity. This is true for all the other indices we can pull up in the AFFHT. And for the school proficiency index, it's the same. So does the neighborhood rank in, uh, how does it rank in percentile? So is it in the 100th percentile or is it in the, in the bottom 10th percentile? So these higher numbers are corresponded, uh, cor correspond to shading. And the darker areas mean higher opportunity, higher values, higher opportunity. So um, how you interpret this is these, rel these neighborhoods relative to each other. And um, sometimes it's hard to see you know, what this medium gray means compared to this dark gray. So you can actually cl and cl click on a tract, and you'll be able to see the um, school proximity index. I don't think I've zoomed in enough, so it's saying no. All right, there's one. So this particular area is 68. I'm going to drag this over. So this would correspond to this shade of gray. But instead of having to do that, you can look at this and say, OK, this neighborhood is ranked in the 68th percentile. Um, and so it's not so bad. It's not at the top. Um, you know, It's not in the highest ranking, but it's definitely not at the lowest. Um, and then you can click on another track, maybe closer tracks. This one is uh, relatively lower ranked compared to the other neighborhoods. So that's where you would take a look at, um, instead of having to go to the map and find this, we also included it in this RAD table. So if we scoot along just to the right hand here, um, we have a track level six of 61. One thing that may be confusing, if you, if you decide to go to the map instead of this table that we've provided, in the map, we break them up by block groups. And block groups are smaller building blocks to equal a track. So mo several tra you know, many tracks have three block groups within them. 
Well, that is um, the, the school proximity index in the, in the AFFH mapping tool gives them by block group. So you're actually not getting a track level um, measure, which all the other measures we've, you've been looking through and throughout this whole uh, review process are track level data. So to avoid confusing you, what we what we're able to do in the table is to get a weighted average across those block groups and have one that represents the whole tract. So in this tract that we were looking at in the beginning, census tract, is um, ranked 61, and so it's in the 61st percentile um, of schools. And if I wanted, I can go ahead and pick up, um, go back to the ACE of HT. Uh, on this left-hand panel, I can choose a different grantee, so I can go back to Seattle um, by going back through the menu here. And again, it doesn't matter which map variation you choose here because I'm going to turn it off just so we can have a good visual of what's going on here in Seattle. So you can see here the what mo most Seattleites and, and uh, locals will tell you uh, that this is not new. The areas in the north uh, part of Seattle have higher are, tend to be, these neighborhoods tend to have higher school quality than the ones in the south part of it. But if I want to look at that one track that I, um, that was proposed in my RAD review, for example, if it was track 81, I, I know it's down here, but I don't have to go to the map if I just want to get a quick figure, because that'll be in the table here, and that's in gray. And so this is the number you can note when you are writing this up here how it's doing. You could say it's ranked in 61st percentile for all, um, compared to all neighborhoods in the, in the state. So I, do we have any questions? Happy to answer them. Um, I will, these, these tables, these tools will be on the SharePoint. And what I would re recommend you do is as soon as you can open on SharePoint, save a copy to your local drive. It's going to be protected so you don't have to worry about messing up numbers. And if you do, if somehow you're able to, you, you think you've messed it up, delete it from your computer and go ahead and go back to the SharePoint and, and download, the, um, download it again. And then just remember that you're, the first thing you do when you see all this, so if I clear all the filters here, this looks overwhelming, it looks just, you know, there's just too many numbers, but it, once you start filtering through, and in the locked copy, these filtering um, tools here, these little arrows will stay live. You won't ever have to lose them. If you do, you just have to click filter here. But you go from left to right in these first three columns, filter down by state, filter down by county, and then filter down by your census tract. Jordan, was there... Did that cover what you wanted to in the AFFHT? Yeah, it did. Okay. All right. I'm not showing any questions right now, but we'll give, give folks a minute or two to think about uh, what's been presented and see if they have any questions. Okay, I'm going to open this up. Should I be using this little panel here on the right? I haven't been, but... Oh, yeah, I'll read out the questions. I don't know if you can see, Tricia, but I'll read them out. Okay. Um, is the school proficiency score compared to other schools in the state? And this question is from Andrew. Uh, yes, so it takes all of the neighborhoods across each state and says, based on their fourth grade um, student performance, how do these rank? So it's limited. It's not, gonna, uh, it's not a comprehensive measure. But it's one measure, it's one cut at it, and using fourth grade um, test scores and fourth grade performance. And so it takes all the neighborhoods, um, takes all the scores, and weights them by the number of students. Um, it's, a, it's a very detailed formula, but I'm happy to pass that information on if you'd like, see how that's calculated. And then we get this um, ranking of all the neighborhoods, so those that ranked on the bottom compared to the top. But it does reflect the, the differences among neighborhoods across the whole state. 
The other indices, um, most of the other indices in the AFFHT, which we don't really pull up here, but if, if you wanted to look at, they're all nationally based rankings. So that neighborhood compared to all the neighborhoods across uh, the U.S. and Puerto Rico. But for school, it's just state ranking. Okay. We have a comment from Arturo. No question. Just wanted to say what a great job Tricia did. <laughs> Thank you, Arturo. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, and one thing I want to point out here, this is this is something that because you're not you may not be used to this data set, I've probably looked at it too long that it doesn't stand out to me, but do you see I'm here and I've been moving around the table and I see the same number over and over again for each one and you might go, oh my gosh, this data set's wrong, why is it all the same? Well, it's because these are all different tracks, but the columns we're looking at are housing market areas. So they would, they all live, they are all located in the same uh, region, so they will have the same region value. But if you scroll over and just bump over to the left a bit, you'll see those differences uh, among the different neighborhoods. And these are, even though it seems overwhelming, these are all very basic, um, you know, back of the envelope, you know, on a kitchen on a kitchen napkin, you can write these numbers down if you're able to pull up these tables. And um, if you want to walk through those exercises, I can, we can see about putting that together here. Um, but what we wanted to do is just put it in one table so you didn't have to go through those um, steps on, with the census tool. Tricia, thank you so very much. That was very helpful, and um, I'm sure you have a bigger fan base than just Arturo. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone around this table, as well as Arturo, and I'm sure other folks in the uh, field as well. But thank you so much. That was very thorough and very helpful, and thank you for making the table. Um, it's going to make life a lot easier for the reviewers. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, and you're welcome to stay on and uh, as we do our wrap up because we're at the end of our training. Um, but you, you don't have to stay if you don't want to. Okay, sounds good. Do I just hand over? I'll, I'll stay on, but do I hand over control? I don't know what to do here. I'm going to take control back. Perfect. Right. Thank you. All right, great. Okay, so um, talking about next steps. Um, first, I want to thank, uh, before we go into that, I want to thank, again, the Program Standards and Compliance Division team. They have done an awesome job of pulling everything together from access to the resource desk, to rearranging the resource desk, to writing all these documents you've been looking at, to giving the examples, to um, just everything that you've had over the past few days has taken a great deal of work over the last two months. Uh, including all of these data tables, the uh, data that you saw yesterday, the alternative geographies that you see um, participation in this process, as well as PDNRs. Uh, it's been a team effort and also want to thank Dan for his contribution uh, and keeping us uh, rolling throughout the last couple of days. The, um, and uh, most of all, I want to also thank Celia for her leadership of the team over the last couple of months. She told me uh, just two days ago, she said, I'm taking off on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> there was no request. It was like, I will not be here. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for your leadership. OK, so uh, RAD Site and Neighborhood Standards is 100% live in the field now. It's been live for a little while with uh, several folks, but uh, it is now 100% live. And you have your desk officers who will be assigning to the regional director or the regional director's designee uh, within a 24-hour period the site neighborhood standards that are in your region. There are other reviews, as we've talked about. There's another um, a phase two of training that will be coming. Um, but we do have people that are already doing uh, several of those types of reviews. and particularly the one that all of the housing authorities have to complete, which is the housing, uh, the accessibility and relocation checklist. So when you go into the status of reviews, one of those reports you saw on the resource desk, you'll see that is the longest list. <laughs> and, uh, and it's the, um, as we said earlier, that those reviews are much shorter than these. And so we wanted 
to stay with, uh, to cover the most complicated uh, review process and all of the data for you on the first training, and then we'll follow up with the second training. And the um, um, but the reviewers will be working with me to ensure that everything is assigned. And I meet with them on a weekly, I'm sorry, the reviewers, the desk officers. I meet with them on a weekly basis to and look at the Excel report to see that everything actually is assigned so that we're not leaving anything out there for, oops, it looks like we have a couple other questions. We'll get back to those in a second. Um, the, uh, but making sure that everything is assigned, has a name attached to it, um, regional directors are engaged, the uh, supervisors are engaged. If for some reason, I know the RDs currently are on a call with headquarters, but if for some reason you do not have a designee in addition to the regional director, uh, I, I think I saw that there were maybe three or four regions that did not have a designee yet, that um, that would be an important component of this because uh, I think the last thing the RD wants to do is be the, per the point person for every single site neighborhood standards or any other reviews that they have to um, have to uh, review as well as go into the system and take care of. So a supervisory designee is, uh, is helpful and also takes care of vacations and you know, when folks are at extended meetings or on travel. The um, one thing that we're going to do in a, uh, in a month, we're going to hold, I'm going to include all of the desk officers, but to uh, have some smaller group uh, follow-up meetings uh, with maybe a group of regions, depending on the size of the region, it might be two or three regions with your particular desk officers, but also include the others um, for learning purposes as well as um, if they've seen something similar in their regions, they can respond as well but want to do a follow-up with you um, individually at, well, as a small group in order to see if there are any follow-up questions, confusion, anything that's come up, if we need to start doing frequently asked questions that help you through the process. But we want it to be as comprehensive and as um, seamless as absolutely possible. So we're here as a resource and um, also provided lots of uh, data resources in hopes of making it easy that you didn't have to, easier, or I should say, so you don't have to go and research all of that yourself and really using technology to help us do our, our job, which is certainly the way we're headed in all that we do. Um, okay, well, I think that is our wrap up. The, um, the last piece, and we'll, uh, and then we'll take the two, last two questions. The last piece is we will have a follow-up email. Uh, I didn't hear anything come up today that we needed to follow up on, but we did generate a, a list yesterday, and we were working on that list after the training yesterday to make sure that we have everything that we will be sending out to you, as well as a couple of fixes on the resource desk. If there's something that, um, when that email comes to you, is something that we missed, just send us an email, and we'll get that uh, back out to you as well. So with that, let's take uh, any questions. Uh, Charles, okay. Hi, Charles. <laughs> You're asking the right person, right? I'm the SOP person. Um, he knows that from having worked in Region 4. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the SOP is the protocol that we went over yesterday. And uh, that is also available on the SharePoint site. And the link that we'll be sending you is the uh, it, to the SharePoint site will be in that follow-up email. Okay. We have a question from Stacy. Uh, the checklist is marked as a draft. Uh, how close is this version to becoming finalized? Okay. So we were working on, on it up to the last minute. Um, so when we provided it to you yesterday morning, it was marked as draft, but uh, just because we had taken the watermark off. <laughs> that was just a mistake. It is the final checklist, and we will also be following up and sending that out to you. Uh, it, it, it is going to be marked version. It is marked version 1.2. Um, and we will remove the, the watermark from it. And it was nice to see all my, um, I think almost all of my Region 4 colleagues in programs and compliance participating at the last couple of days. All right, let me open it up to the desk officers if they have any last thoughts, comments that they want to make.
All right. Well, this concludes our training. It is not the, the last touch that we will have with you, but um, congratulations on completing the training. And Rad Site Neighborhoods is live in the field. So thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.